Over the last couple of months, you've generously provided me with the only thing that could possibly drive me more insane than my house did. The community project Ramp 2023 attracted almost 300 maps, making it the largest compilation of original levels ever compiled for Doom. Nevertheless, I was somehow able to get them all working together, play through the whole collection, and put a slightly My House influenced game together around them. During that time, a few leftovers came to light that I hadn't covered in the first three parts of my exploration of the infamous house, so here's a fourth part to answer some questions and tie up some loose ends. Throughout all of this, it's important to remember that My House does not run on the original Doom engine, despite its reputation as a Doom 2 mod. Even though it looks like Doom, it uses a new map file format that the 90s Doom Xs don't understand, called UDMF for Universal Doom Mapping Format. This is a fan-made specification that combines the Doom-style level descriptions of lines and things and sectors with multiple enhancements, such as scripting, dynamic and coloured lighting, swimming in water, portal effects and many others. You're likely to be running My House under GZ Doom, which started off as a port of Doom in the early 2000s, but which has now evolved so much that it's arguably a game engine of its own that happens to be able to run Doom wads. Sometimes I see people getting hung up on how My House has rooms above and below each other, or is able to contain swinging doors or produce other effects that would have been jaw-dropping on the 90s Doom engine. But under GZ Doom and other modern source ports of its kind, many of these effects are pretty commonplace. They're things that have been made possible by the work of a large fan community over many years. However, the author or authors of My House certainly deserve credit for finding such creative and surprising ways to use them. Let's take another journey into this madness together. Special thanks to Thingy, the Temporal Discussion Podcast, Lemon314, Lord Entropy, Avalie Long, JL, Laszlo Panaflex, Metric Conversion, Nubik's Cube, Velsharan, A, Bender Waffles Feek, Tashtari, Shine Wolf, Ryan Devil23, Ministry of Ennui Control, Miko Zeech, and Grizzly Old B for sponsoring the creation of these videos. Go to David X Newton on Patreon to join the ASCII Brigade. One of the most frequently asked questions on my previous three My House videos was how the player, standing in the garden outside the altered house, was able to see through windows into multiple locations on different floors of the house at the same time. It seems such a simple thing if you're thinking about the whole house as one 3D scene, but remember that the upper and lower floors of the house are expressed as two distinct locations on the map. The player is only transported to the lower floor when they go down the interior stairs from the garage or the house entrance. When they're outside, they're always in the upper copy of the house, and the rooms in the lower floor don't exist there. So how do these windows see into the basement rooms? If you're thinking with portals, that's what I would have expected as well. The lines in the lower windows could be set up as line portals to give the player a view into another part of the map. But there's a problem here because parts of the windows on the upper and lower floors are vertically aligned with each other. In GZ Doom, a line can only handle one portal at a time. There's no concept of having a line that can see into one area above a certain height and a completely different area below it. Faced with this, I personally would have reworked the entire house a bit so that no windows coincided vertically, but my house's author wasn't satisfied with such a crude solution. Instead, they decided, if I can't make these windows portals, I'm going to find a way to portal the entire wall in. If you look at the map in Ultimate Doom Builder, you can see the windows aren't there at all, and the lower portion of the wall isn't actually a wall, it's a very stretched texture over a near vertical sloped floor. Within these near vertical sectors are a couple of mysterious objects called upper stack look only and lower stack look only. I had no idea what was happening here, so I recreated the situation in a test map. The pairs of upper and lower stack objects are one of the many possible ways to instruct GZ Doom to project sectors as if they're stacked on top of one another. This is actually a deprecated way of doing it, but they come with a special, possibly unintended side effect, which is utilised in an unexpected way, very much in character with the rest of my house. In this example, we've arranged two sectors so that the ceiling of one sector is at the same height as the floor of another sector. We then put an upper stack look only thing into the sector that should appear above, and a lower stack look only thing into the one below, making sure their tag numbers match. This will instruct GZ Doom to make it possible to look into the lower sector from the upper one as if it were directly below it. As the object class name suggests, the effect is only visual, and the player can't actually move between the two distinct areas directly. Here, the player is in the tan upper sector, and they can see the grey lower sector below them, but the floor of the upper sector is still solid and it looks like they're walking on air. 
That's how it works if we use the feature like normal people, but what happens if we try the same thing but put the areas at the same height and apply a slope to the upper area that reaches from the floor to the ceiling? We'll get a very angry message from Graf Zal probably, but if we get past that and look at the results of our chaos, we can see this does somehow work. The portion of the grey lower sector that's below the line of the tan upper sector's floor slope is projected correctly into the upper sector, with the walls on the sides following the angle of the slope and it allows the complete wall at the end to be seen. If we then narrow the sloped sector down, we can get it to a point where the edges aren't noticeable, and it just looks like a single wall has been transported in. Having got that, we can add all the detailing and portals we want to both the upper and lower sectors, and the two won't interfere with each other. And this is the exact kind of mischief that my house is doing. The very narrow sloped sectors stretching up over the lower portion of the upper house's wall have the upper stack look only things in them, which match the corresponding lower stack look only things in the lower floor copy of the house. Therefore, the lower house's wall and its windows are projected into the upper copy of the house and let the player see into a part of the level that doesn't really exist there. A side effect of this arrangement, and a clue that led me to understand what was happening here, is that you can't genuinely see through to the garden if you're looking through the house's basement. To demonstrate with an entirely randomly picked object, if there's a soul sphere directly outside one of the windows at the corner, it will apparently have disappeared if you try to look at it through the other window. This is because your line of sight has been interrupted by the portal, and is going through the basement and out the window to the garden in the lower copy of the house where the soul sphere doesn't exist. But with this oddity aside, this really is an incredible use of a very possibly unintended quirk of sector portals to copy just a limited slice of wall to somewhere else. Continuing with the theme of windows, there are a few in the Brutalist house that deserve some more attention. If you strafe run off the ledge that represents the porch of the larger house where Pumpkin Rick resides, you'll find that you can reach the window directly opposite. It's lit in the same strange stark yellow as the other room we've been in, and contains the map's only megasphere which boosts the player to a massive 200% health and the best possible armour. The drawback here is that there's no way back from this window, and the player will then have to jump down into the void and make their way back via the endless staircase to continue with the game. There's another window that can't be reached, but it does contain something unusual. It's visible from the living room slash dog area of the smaller copy of the Brutalist house. From across the gap, you can see a gangly figure peeking out at you from behind a curtain. When you approach, it slides out of view because the image of the figure is a texture called Shadow Zero One applied to a poly object, and it's set to move aside when the player crosses this line. I skipped over this mysterious figure when describing this part of the game for the first time because there really isn't anything technically complicated about it, but if we look closer, there's something else going on here as well. The line representing the mystery apartment owner's front door has an action set on it, not as a door by itself because it's actually a wall with nothing behind it, but it tells the sector with tag 211 to door raise when the player uses it. The player can't reach this line in what passes for normal gameplay in my house because there's nowhere to jump across. In addition, the front part of the alcove here is defended with an actor enter sector object which will spirit the player away into the back rooms if they attempt to get into it. But it's possible to work around it by no clipping into the window next door and then making your way across. Sector 211 is this doorway in the smaller copy of the Brutalist house, which leads out to where the house's porch would be. As seen in so many classic Doom maps, the door raise action will raise the ceiling of a sector to four map units below the nearest adjacent ceiling, then lower it back to the floor after a delay. In the initial state of the Brutalist House, performing a door raise action here would do nothing because the floor and ceiling here are already at the same height, so the sector can't act as a door. However, if the player has previously opened this doorway by lowering the concrete slab into the ground, then the action can have an effect. It will attempt to raise the ceiling, realise it's already raised, then will delay a few cycles and will close the ceiling down to the floor. The usually hidden upper line that faces into the main part of the house has the now unnerving panel 2 door texture, making it appear that a new door has suddenly grown. The player can't interact with it because there are no more actions in the map that affect this sector, meaning they're now blocked off from getting to the porch unless they dare to noclip again. As to why all of this is there, I really can't begin to tell you. All I can guess is that getting to the skinny creature's door might at some point have been part of a planned route that was later abandoned. There are further hints of incomplete routes in the airport section. In the security area, there are actually two sets of sectors hidden behind the east wall. The southern one is just a blank alcove that's blocked off by a wall that can never be opened. 
The northern one is blocked off in a similar way, but forms a tunnel to a garage area that's inaccessible. When the player uses the door leading to the garage section of the larger copy of the Brutalist House, it will lower the floor of sectors tagged 388. This will make the door that the player is interacting with open, along with a wall on the far side of this tunnel. Unfortunately, this makes absolutely no difference from a practical point of view because the rest of the tunnel is still closed and the player can't see the effect. But if you edit the tunnel as well, or no clip through the closed section, you'll be able to get through and be rewarded with a featureless grey box similar to the Brutalist area. There are no further portals or things to interact with from this section, although you can fall off the ledge and be dumped into the back rooms if you like. That's all there is to this fairly disappointing mystery. This could all have been an abandoned way to get back to the Brutalist house from the airport, or part of yet another planned route, or simply an oversight when copy and pasting. Alternatively, the My House author just felt like driving all of us just a little bit more insane. Something I didn't touch on in my earlier videos is the Nightmare difficulty setting. In regular Doom, this is the highest difficulty. It was added a couple of releases in to be deliberately ridiculous after players in 1994 said the ultraviolence difficulty now seemed a bit too easy. When the Nightmare difficulty is selected, the player is asked to confirm their choice with the question, are you sure this skill level isn't even remotely fair? And it then does its utmost to live up to that promise. It has several unique conditions to make life very hard for the player. Monsters are quicker and allowed to attack more often, their projectiles move a lot faster, and most vexingly, enemies will respawn in their original locations shortly after being killed. As usual, My House kicks the player's expectations over the horizon here. If you select the Nightmare difficulty in My House, the message is changed to warn the player that this skill level isn't even remotely difficult. And if you choose to proceed, you'll discover that the enemies don't have the superpowers normally granted to them in Nightmare mode. This is done by just redefining the difficulty levels in the PK3's Map Info text lump. The special properties Fast Monsters, Instant Reaction, Disable Cheats and Respawn Time are absent. Map designers in Doom can implement difficulty level differences by flagging objects to appear or not appear when specific skill levels are selected. Typically, a map would have more or stronger enemies as the difficulty goes up, and potentially fewer helpful pickups like health and ammunition. In a small isolated example of this WOD playing something straight, the monsters in the airport bathroom scare have their difficulty flags arranged like this. On the lowest difficulty, the player will be faced with four of the crawling blood monsters called Striga. On skill 2, two of them will be replaced by the faster, meaner and more projectile blood fiends, and an extra one will be replaced for the next two skill levels after that. However, on Nightmare mode, the room reverts to very easy, with all the blood fiends once again banished. Unexpected objects are excluded from the Nightmare mode this way throughout My House, taking away monsters instead of adding them. Most of the monsters in the Burned House and Bath House are gone, and it removes the vast majority of the spots where monsters are meant to spawn in during the Great Siege of the House and Shell Station at the end. On the hardest non-special difficulty, Ultra Violence, there are 112 monsters to begin with, reduced to 91 on Nightmare. And once the final battle is set up, the difference is even starker, with 208 monsters being added on UV, compared to Nightmare's relatively limp 32. By choosing Nightmare to go through this nightmare, the player has a much easier time. To add another layer of complication to things, My House hasn't just remained as a constant since its release in March 2023. Like all the high-tier horrors beyond human comprehension, it grew, changed and evolved behind our backs. To be precise, there appear to have been three distinct versions to date. The version that was originally uploaded and linked on Doomworld at the beginning of March, then a second version when the download was altered to include all the Google Drive extras a couple of weeks later, and the current and assumed final version which was quietly uploaded to replace the one in the Google Drive at the end of April. I began recording my analysis videos on the second version, but switched to the third one for the last stretch of the game beyond the discovery of the petrol station. By going through the contents of the three different PK3s in Beyond Compare, I was able to identify that a lot of the changes just fixed mistakes such as correcting very subtle texture alignment issues, but also uncovered some more interesting differences. There's a bug in the very first version of My House where either entering the Brutalist House via the Twilight Zone portal in the Furnace Room, or entering the Bath House by sinking to the bottom of the tub would cause the player to enter a sector that ran Script 64 called Music Liminal. This script would change the music to the ambient run in 3 and remove the Actor Enter Sector object in the bathtub, therefore blocking entrance to the Bath House no matter which of these portals was used. 
The second release changed this so that the bathtub teleport isn't disabled when going through the Brutalist House portal, but I don't think there's a way to encounter this bug during non-cheating gameplay anyway. If the player enters the Brutalist House without the ring or the dice artifacts from the bathhouse, there's no way to get back to the altered house to notice the bathtub is no longer functional. The trick with the tumbler changing its location in the bathroom mirror when the attic mirror is uncovered was also added in the second release, giving the player a hint that there was something to be done here, although the effect is so subtle that I'm not sure how many people picked up on it. And in the third release, the 20 sided dice at the bottom of the pool moved from the second lane marker to hovering right above the entrance to the underwater tunnel, making sure that if the player discovers one of them they don't miss the other. Changes weren't limited to the maps either. In the third version's credits text lump, the two Ds in 3D Realms and Duke Nukem 3D were mysteriously changed to lower case. This unimportant seeming change was the clue that made the community realise the significance of the capital letters in this file, and eventually revealed the identities of the two musicians that contributed to this chaos. I just described the unexpected attitude my house takes to the nightmare difficulty setting a moment ago, but the initial release took it even further. Originally, the alleged highest difficulty level began with just 83 monsters, which is 8 fewer than the second release. The Childhood Nightmare is among the excluded monsters, letting the player avoid one of the game's major fights, but also leaving them unable to get out of the foggy playground because there's no way to obtain the gate key that Shrek usually drops. Therefore, it's not like you can get there, but the climactic battle was declawed even more comically, with just five monsters being added when the player leaves the mirrored campsite and summons the mirror vials. Four of those monsters are the mirror vials themselves, and the entire final confrontation is handled by one solitary Baron of Hell hanging around the bus stop. He does his best, but is verifiably not even remotely difficult. Speaking of the mirror vials, in the third version their definition was changed, having their health raised dramatically from 50,000 to 5 million hit points, and their pain chance dropped from 256 all the way down to 30. Pain Chance describes the likelihood out of 255 that a monster will be stunned while taking damage, so the Mirror Vials were previously always stunnable and easy to keep completely immobilised while running away. This may have been changed because it gave players too much of an advantage back over the monsters they were meant to flee from. A couple of people in the Doom World My House thread were confused about some mysterious door opening noises when using one of the walls downstairs in the modern living room, or upstairs on the balcony in the airport. These were actually the sounds of the doors directly above or below those positions opening when the lines were activated. Because of the way that actions are applied to lines in the Doom level format without a concept of height by default, it's easy to accidentally have doors and switches interactable from far above or below their intended position when you're making more Z-axis heavy environments. Apparently someone was paying attention to that thread because in the third release, the way these lines worked was altered so that they had invisible switch textures applied to them, and the game was set to check against those instead of considering the whole wall. Therefore, as of the latest release, they're now only switchable when the player uses them from the correct height. Another loose end is visible at the petrol station. Among the assets of all three versions is a 17th artifact called the Quarter, which gives the message I'd like to make a collect call when it's picked up. In only the original version of my house, one of the phones at the side of the Shell station was a usable line that was locked with lock number 10. It seems logical that these two things were meant to be connected in some way at some point, but in the earliest version available to us, lock number 10 actually uses the blue skull key, and the quarter isn't mentioned or used anywhere. The action the line performs is action number 67, floor raise instantly by value times 8, but the sector number it points to and the value to raise by are both zero, so the line never has any effect even if the blue skull is held. This line action was removed completely in the second version, but the quarter definition and its sprite have remained. The change that interests me the most is something that can only be seen in the earliest version of the Flooded House. In this copy there are three lines stacked behind each other on the overflowing sink in the kitchen, which have actions that raise the water level of the kitchen and bath in the altered house and lower the invisible barrier next to the bathtub. These actions have been removed in the second version, and it looks like their presence in the flooded house was a mistake. The player will already have done all there is to do with the water levels in the altered house by the time they get here. In the days before scripting was available to Doom maps, grouping usable lines together like this was the accepted way to trigger more than one action at once, 
You can see John Romero doing this in the famous Blue Key Room in the third map of Doom 1, where the player walks over two very close lines to make the lights go out and a door open up behind them. I suspect that the three lines at the sink might have originally been in the Altered House as a first attempt at implementing the Rising Water level scripts, and that they were copy and pasted over from there when the Flooded House was constructed. Later on in development, the author removed the three separate actions from the Altered House and replaced them with the much easier on the brain script that now exists there, but accidentally left the old attempt in the Flooded House until deleting it in the late March version. If my thoughts on this are true, if the author of my house is not someone who was used to doing more physical doomish script workarounds and was starting to experiment with UDMF and scripting throughout the construction of this map, then they've truly planted red herrings on a level never seen before in the history of civilization. Those were the big additional mysteries that I wanted to look at, but I also wanted to answer some of the smaller questions that people left in the comments of the first three videos. Some very similar questions were asked by multiple people, so even if I don't show yours, thank you so much for asking. Fujonium asks, how do the walkable arches work, such as the one above the dog rooms, and is this another set line portal trick? This doesn't have to do with portals, although it could have been done with them. It's actually a much more straightforward technique which UDMF calls 3D floors. As we all know by now, one of the fundamental things about the Doom engine is that, disregarding what we know about portals for the moment, you can't have space above or below another space. The engine allows for a floor height, a ceiling height, and that's it. So this even excludes simple structures like a shelf sticking out of a wall, or indeed this arch over the brutalist living room that can be walked on or passed under. Without portals, we can't have multiple floors and ceilings in the same vertical space, but we can cheat by adding a solid area between the sector's floor and ceiling. This is done by applying the set 3D floor action to a line that borders a dummy sector placed outside the map, and specifying what sector tag number should receive this 3D floor. GZ Doom will create a platform with its top and bottom aligned with that reference sector's floor and ceiling in any sector with a tag that matches. My house uses 3D floors to add details to fairly simple situations like this, although it is possible for them to be coerced to make entire 3D buildings. The balcony at the airport has the heaviest use of them in my house, but portals tend to be a more practical solution once you get into any degree of complexity. Iris Piva asks, can you show us the house switching into an empty lot without your back turned against the house? Yes, it's not a particularly impressive transition. Because you're walking backwards through a line portal from one place to another, the house apparently just disappears because you're looking at one area before you step through, and a completely different area on the next frame. Second question, what happens if you try to no-clip in the beach or the gravestone area? If you try this from either of the beaches, the game will prevent you from getting out of there, using the same ideas for the black confinement space used for the television and after the fake beach. The playable area is surrounded by sectors with actor enter sector objects in them, which will activate even if the player is no-clipped, and in this case the assigned action is to teleport the player back to the area they're meant to be in. The gravestone area only has part of its space blocked off by guard sectors in this way, but the player is likely to be caught and backroomed by other guard sectors elsewhere in the map if they've venture too far from it. Third question, what happens if you try killing the dog at the end? Hold on, I'll check. Nothing, because the object representing the sleeping dog is set up like a decoration, and it doesn't take damage or have the concept of hit points. So that's a relief. Andrew D. Williams asks, when you reach the real beach, or use the clapperboard at the fake beach, you lose all your weapons and end up with just your fists. Is this the same trick that runs at the hospital? It's actually a lot simpler, because the game doesn't have to do any setup with the intent to give you your weapons back. When you cross into the real beach, an actor enter sector object, placed at one of the entrance sectors, runs script 23, Beach Ambience. This will run clear inventory, then give you the smooth fist weapon and the Zed Doom dummy object, and then remove itself from the map. Even though it sounds a bit strange that you have to be given your own fist, it is counted as an inventory weapon and so won't survive a clear inventory call. And just like any other weapon in my house, the smooth fist definition contains sequences for both the original and smooth attack animations, with the presence of the Zed Doom dummy object deciding which one to use. The clapperboard has even less courtesy. Script 37 just clears your inventory out completely. Now we've got some thoughts about alternative routes through the game. Crimson Destroyer asks, what happens if you collect all eight Mirror World items and then go to the unused Mirror Empty Lot? Unfortunately, nothing. You can see the mirrored and normal empty lots side by side in Ultimate Doom Builder here, and the mirrored copy clearly just doesn't have the tunnel. 
There's no action on the lines of defence that would have opened the tunnel either, so this is a dead end. Captain Kirk asks if anyone has burned down the Mirror World after visiting the airport. They haven't, again because the possibility just doesn't exist. The Mirror World copy of the house doesn't contain the cupboard behind the bootcase with the faulty fuse box, and there's no burned version of the Mirror World present in the map. Big Zero Bad Zero Brad asks, is it possible to unplug the TV while dying, then later get out of the fake ending by plugging the TV back in? This one is an interesting thought, and I made an effort to find a workaround, but I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Here are the facts again. When we unplug the television, or use the clapperboard on the fake beach, the screen is faded to black and we're transported to a little black box. If we got here by unplugging the television and running script 71, there is now an action assigned to the wall in front of us that will run script 72 to simulate plugging the television back in again, and will transport us back to the yellow room. The action is removed as part of that script, so if you later come back to this box via the fake beach, you can't escape again. So we need to somehow get out of the box without using that line action. Is there a way for us to do that? I thought there might be by using the hospital teleport. Between the player triggering the unplug script and them being teleported, there's a six frame delay so that they can see the loose plug on the floor. If the player could somehow die during those six frames, the death think function would save the position and angle of the player before the script finished its delay and moved them to the box. My idea was that they could then complete the hospital sequence to be teleported back out into the yellow room where their position was saved, avoiding using up the line action. Unfortunately this doesn't work because the script that saves the player's position doesn't just do it once. It will continuously write the player's current position until they're resurrected, so the player will be restored into the black box even if they initially died outside of it. Another fairly major issue is that the television script blacks out the screen using an ACS fade to command, and the hospital script deals with screen fading using a different method that doesn't interact with it. So if they avoided script 72, then the player would have to complete the rest of the game without the benefit of sight. Sleepy Boys asks what if you no clipped to the Soul Sphere? It works. There aren't any no-clip defences going from the interior to the exterior of the house, or across the teleportation line in the garden, so this does work. You can even get it from both the upper and lower house copies. Organic Superlube says, The irregular sectors in the daycare kitchen are for giving the floor different colourations, altering reflectiveness and blood spatters. Actually, given your clear understanding of doom mapping, you're probably not talking about those ones, which is accidentally the most savage benefit of the doubt I've ever been given. I was indeed talking about those ones, and I just didn't notice. The sectors I thought might have been meant to represent cracks or spills in the floor at one point are indeed there to form reflective patches or mysterious blood spatters. The bloodied tiled floor texture looks like this, which would look very tacky and repetitive if applied to the entire floor, so the author split the floor up into irregular patches to just use pieces of it. If whoever basically transcribed my video onto TV Tropes wants to correct that, I'd be very grateful for that as well. Father Jack Hackett has for a moment become lucid enough to ask about the exit portals on the Brutalist area. There are several of these dotted around the exterior windows placed tantalisingly out of reach. Zorilla Zero has a video on how to get to one of them, which I'll link in the description, and the technique involves using the blast damage from the rocket launcher to boost yourself over the gap. There's nothing more to see here, however, because like all portals that the player can't normally reach, they will punish the player with a trip to the back rooms. Empty Kingdoms challenges, how would one reactivate cheats for the Wadlam? This is pretty straightforward because it's not really the cheats that have been turned off, it's just the part of the code that allows a cheat to give the player something. That's why things like god mode and no clipping still work. This code is exposed in Zscript, and it's visible in the custom player class that my house uses. It's called cheat give, and my house's version of it doesn't do anything, it contains only three comments that look like they came from some tutorial or other. If you open up the Zscript file in the PK3 and delete this function from the class, then the cheats will work again, because without the override here, the original Doom Player's cheat give function will be called instead. Oddly, the chainsaw code ID Choppers is an exception to the disabled giving cheats. The C++ code for this cheat calls the give inventory type function directly instead of going through cheat give, so it's unaffected by this change. EgoAlter1276 asks, what stops the mirror vials from no clipping into the alternate versions of the houses? This is a great question, and I should have thought of it when I was doing the original videos. The mirror vial monster has the ability to walk through walls, so it follows that it would be able to cross the blank spaces between the different copies of the house and continue to haunt the player from there. 
My house prevents this with the same system that it uses for catching players that are no-clipping through the map. In places where the mirror vial might cross out of bounds, there are two actor enters sector objects instead of just one. The second objects are assigned an action that teleports the activating actor back to a point that's within bounds again, and they have both the players cannot activate and monsters can activate flags set. This means that while the player will activate the first actor enter sector object and be teleported to the back rooms for entering these sectors, a monster will activate the second one and will be placed back where it belongs, like the player would be on the beach endings. The same technique is used to keep Skin Stealer confined in the back rooms. Unlike many other monsters, he wanders at random even when idle, so it's important that he's confined to his own space. Redacted9606 raises the very good point, if the mirrors are actually portals, why did the blue key need to be edited to remove its reflection? It doesn't. I didn't notice this because I was hung up on the idea of the attic mirror actually being a mirror, but it isn't. It's a visual portal to the mirrored attic, and the same is true in reverse. Some of the mirrors in the house are actually mirrors, but none of them are close to the blue skull key, so the blue skull being modified not to show in mirrors doesn't end up making a difference. Further to this, Venom Fox observes, that's not a blue skull, it's a box of Scottish Blend tea bags. Yes, you have a shockingly good tea recognition sense, and you did see a box of Scottish Blend in the attic of the house during my videos. Because of being colourblind, I sometimes have difficulty telling the difference between the red and yellow keys especially, so a couple of years ago I put together a patch wad that replaced the key sprites with various separately identifiable Scottish themed things. It started with a can of iron brew, and then spiralled from there. I have them configured to load automatically when I start GZ Doom, and I've been playing with them on for so long now that I barely notice that they're very much not the original Doom sprites. As a result, when capturing certain clips I just forgot to turn them off. In fact, it's only when I got here that I realised I had earlier recorded Doom Guy desperately rescuing a can of Tenant Super Strength Lager from the darkness of the Toxin Refinery. So fortunately, these tea bags have a rational explanation, and they're not yet another layer of madness thrown onto us by the house. I think this time it's reasonable to say that we've seen all the tricks that my house has to offer, in terms of engine technicalities that is. The meaning behind all of the details and hints in the direction of the story will keep people speculating for a long time, and it was wonderful to see the mysteries of this house leave the confines of the Doom community and amaze people who hadn't been aware of Doom's last 30 years of evolution. If you enjoyed My House, I really recommend you take a look at more GZ Doom games to see the spectacular things that people have done with the enhanced engine. It's no exaggeration to say there are thousands of new maps that go slightly beyond Doom by using features added to the original engine, along with a large collection of partial or total conversions with a wealth of custom content. Beyond those, enterprising creators have been using it to create entirely new games which don't use the Doom assets at all. The Zen Doom Wiki currently lists 61 games which have been released or are in development with the engine, and they range from restyled first-person shooters all the way up to complete genre changes. Amazingly, many of these creators release their assets to be used freely by the rest of the Doom community. Many of the custom enemies in my house come from a spectacular partial conversion called Hellforged, and they have sprite work easily on par with commercial games. My house is definitely a landmark. It's a creative tangled mystery that surprised us all, and a really impressive use of the engine that brought a lot of attention to GZ Doom from outside its usual circle. But at the same time, it's just a small part of an amazing community that's still building on Doom three decades after its release. If you've come there via my house, please enjoy your stay.